Welcome to part 2. If you didn't take in part 1, there's a link in the description area of this video on YouTube. Yeah, you'll find it there. Click to it and you'll be able to go right back so that we're on the same page. Now, there are many things you don't understand as a three-year-old. For instance, I would not have known then when I was caught up in this very heavy gunfire by shifter terrorists. I would not have known that 1967 was the year when the shifter war was at its height yeah, in the northern part of Kenya. Now, as most of you know, my political lecturer was a policeman and he got posted to virtually every corner of our beautiful country. And so, at this particular time I'm talking about, we were in Isiolo. And I know some of you have been to Isiolo. Now, I have very fond memories of Isiolo, even as young as I was then. One of them was that on most days, uh, when the sun was setting, I could see an elephant. An elephant silhouette, yeah, in front of the sinking sun, yeah, in the horizon. I kid you not. And it must have been very beautiful, because I've forgotten many things since then. Those are many decades ago. But that one has stubbornly stuck on my mind. Just like this horrifying experience I'm about to describe. Now on this night at about 7 p.m., a very serious gunfight, yeah, automatic weapons and all, unfolded right inside our compound. And we could even hear some of the bullets violently hitting against the wall of the house outside. My dad was not in. Yeah, he had gone for his usual evening drink. And so my terrified mother yeah, put me and my brother inside a cupboard. Yeah, and then she joined us. We all hid inside there. It's amazing how some things don't change, eh? Because that's exactly what was happening yesterday. At 14 Riverside Drive, I was terrified. But my brother was more terrified than me. So he threw up inside the cupboard. But we couldn't dare open it. Yeah, so we had to stay in there with all the smell of vomit and all that goes with it. And the terrible noise continued. Yeah, taking only brief lulls and then starting again. And continued until I fell into an exhausted sleep. This was a very serious attack on the Siolo town. And as I came to learn years later, things were not any better for my political lecturer, yeah, who was at the officer's mess drinking. The officer's mess was not too far from where we lived. And it was well within the area of where this massive gunfight was going on between the Kenya army and the Somali shifters. Being an officer's mess, my political lecturer was with the other off-duty policemen having a drink when all hell broke loose. They promptly switched off all the lights and they lay down on the ground, flat, because some of the bullets had already shattered yeah, the windows surrounding the mess, the police officer's mess, yeah, as it's called. Then my political lecturer noticed some liquid yeah, flowing right next to him. And he was alarmed. At first he thought it was blood. That maybe one of the officers had gotten hit. It was pitch dark yeah, inside there. Therefore impossible to tell. And so he used his fingers and he scooped up the liquid and smelt it. Yeah, you know blood has a distinct smell. But it wasn't blood. It was urine. Apparently... The police officer right next to him was so scared that he urinated on himself. That's how serious things were on that fateful day. When I woke up in the morning, it was all quiet. Years later, I was told that the shifters had fled. Yeah, and the Kenya army had picked up their wounded and their dead. And reinforcements had been called in to pursue the shifters yeah, as they fled towards Somalia. Before his death in 2011, I asked my political lecturer, why didn't you resign that day? He laughed, and then he said, resign and go where? And he never said anything more about that. But a few days later, a few days after that fateful day in 1967, something else happened, linked to the shifters. Now, my political lecturer had a colleague, another police officer, a very good friend of his. I believe they're almost the same rank. 
and I believe he's still alive, so I'll not mention his name. He was being driven by his driver, a man called Mutunga, yeah, that's his real name, who was a police constable, you know, a semi-literate uh, police constable. Mutunga was driving his boss, yeah, inside a Land Rover, yeah, that's the only vehicle that can be used uh, in that particular terrain. And then suddenly, without any warning, there was a loud explosion and the police Land Rover was lifted very high up into the air. They had hit a landmine. A landmine planted by the shifters. Mtunga's boss was very badly injured with a suspected punctured lung. He was rushed to a hospital in Meru. And when he arrived, according to my political lecturer, the doctor said he had just arrived on time. A few more minutes and he would never have made it. You see his lungs are stuck together after the explosion, meaning that as he breathed, they didn't move, or something like that. Anyway, he ended up recovering. But Mutunga's injuries were much more serious. Being at the front of the Land Rover, he had taken the brunt yeah, of the impact of that explosion from the landmine. All the bones in his leg were shattered. Yeah, Some of it was almost powder. And he was obviously in great pain. They radioed Nairobi asking for an aircraft to urgently airlift Mtunga for urgent medical treatment because the local medical personnel on the scene had said that it's only Nairobi that could deal with this problem. His were very serious injuries. And there was a problem in Nairobi. They couldn't get any pilot who was prepared to land on the airstrip in Isiolo because everybody knew that Isiolo had a problem of landmines. One young Mzungu pilot finally accepted yeah, after my political lecturer convinced him that he would run police lorries across the airstrip several times until the aircraft was making its final approach and the aircraft landed. Now my political lecturer told this story several times over the years and whenever I reached this part I could see the emotion. Now, you know, he's not a man who could show his emotions. He never showed his emotions. But when he reached this particular part, I could actually sense the emotions in him, in this very hard man. <laughs> he said he gave Mutunga a bottle of water here yeah, to sip. Uh, you know, thirst is a sign of uh, serious internal bleeding. Yeah, I think those in the medical profession will know that. And my political lecturer broke protocol and started speaking to him in vernacular Kikamba. But even as Mutunga lay there with his badly broken body, he was still nervous about his boss. And he kept on answering loudly in English, saying, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, as loudly as he could master, yeah, under the circumstances he was in. And the light aircraft took off. Now in those days, it could not land at uh, Wilson Airport at night because Wilson Airport had not yet had electricity. And the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport was still decades away from being constructed. And so, as the aircraft was uh, doing the final approach to land at the Mbakasi International Airport, the Mzungu pilot in radio contact yeah, with Isiolo told Isiolo Mutunga didn't make it. Because the pilot had just heard some strange noises at the back. You know, the last kicks of somebody who's dying. And that brave pilot didn't need to look behind him to know that Mutunga was gone. All that frantic effort had been for nothing. Yes, Kenyan casualties from these criminals did not start yesterday. They called themselves shifters in those days. Today they call themselves Al-Shabaab. But same people, same criminals, same motivation. So what is this motivation? Now I'm going to keep this very brief because it's a long story. It is all about the Northern Frontier District, yeah, which was later renamed the Northeastern Region. Now Somalia got its independence in 1960. Yeah, and in 1962, Britain was preparing to hand over Kenya to Kenyans. And the Somalis all wanted to be included in one country called Somalia. They yeah, are not divided between different countries. And to confirm this view as being the popular view, the British had done a referendum 
yeah, which uh, by December 1962 they had the results of, and it was overwhelmingly for secession, yeah, for the Northern Frontier District to be included in Somalia as part of Somalia. But the British changed their mind. They refused. They renamed the Northern Frontier District the Northeastern Region yeah, in 8th March 1963 and handed it over to Kenya. This was after a lot of lobbying from the new Kenyan nationalists. Yeah. Interestingly, at the Lancaster House talks yeah, that led to the independence of Kenya, Kadu and Kanu did not agree on anything. They disagreed on virtually everything. Interestingly, even in the way they dressed. <laughs> but that's a story for another day. However, on this issue of the Northern Frontier District remaining a part of Kenya, they totally agreed with Kanu. Kadu and Kanu were in total unanimous agreement. And I believe this is the pressure that led the British to change their minds, rescind the earlier decision, and hand over the Northern Frontier District to the brand new Kenya. Now on your screens, you can see a map with the Northern Frontier District. Yeah. And it is easy to see that both sides were probably motivated by the fact that this area was virtually a third yeah, of the nation of Kenya. How do you give away a third of your country? <laughs> you can see the motivation. But clearly, yeah, Kenya as a country has paid a very high price for this decision. And continues to do so. Our troops today are in Somalia to act as a buffer zone, yeah, to protect us, so that the Somalis don't, the Somali criminals don't find it so easy just to cross the border and harm us and harm our people. And there's plenty of evidence, yeah, to prove that this has worked, yeah, according to plan. It has really helped the country to be safer. And you can be sure if today our forces were to withdraw from Somalia, the attacks would not stop. Whatever the other side says, okay? And you can also be sure that the next demand would be for the Northern Frontier District to be handed back to Somalia. That one you can be sure of. Because this is the mission of what is referred to as the Greater Somalia Republic. And it is even in the design of the Somalia flag yeah, to remind even new generations. The flag has a five-pointed star. It is said that the fourth point is the Northern Frontier District in Kenya. That is really the crux of the issue. And so the attacks started immediately after independence. The shifters were really the armed wing of a political movement. A political movement hell-bent on making sure the Northern Frontier District becomes a part of Somalia. Now on your screens right now, you can see a map of Somalia bordering Ethiopia and Kenya. Now ask yourself, which is the easier country to attack? Obviously Ethiopia, yeah, a much longer border, yeah, a much larger border area, and even much closer to the heart of Somalia. And remember, Ethiopia also have troops in Somalia. So why are all the attacks mainly focused, or rather most of the attacks, focused on Kenya? Why? If the reason is only our troops here in Somalia, why is Ethiopia not getting its fair share of attacks as well? Why? If that's the real reason. Well, today you have the answer. And let the message, very clear message, go to our enemies today. Kenya is no pushover. And Kenya will not be bullied into submission. And yesterday, at 14 Riverside Drive, when our enemies attacked us, I believe they got a very clear response of a message. And the message is this, Mtajua Hamjui, leave Kenya alone. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekuja.